Welcome to the Black Track, where I do commentary and review movies with an all black cast, or at least a black lead. For some reason, today's movie feels like a movie that I'm not really qualified to talk about. The movie dives so deeply and uniquely into the experiences of a woman that I feel like coming from a man's perspective, all I'm going to do is misunderstand the message, but not on purpose. It's just not a life experience that I can relate to, but that's not to say that director Leslie Harris didn't craft a compelling tale that anybody can enjoy. When making 1992's Just Another Girl on the IRT, even Harris knew that it was very important to tell a story from the point of view of a woman because up until this point, black women in black films were basically treated like accessories and their stories were crafted from the minds of black men. So for this movie, she wanted to show a different side of the inner city woman and make it more relatable. Considering the time period, it's probably no shock that Harris had a hard time trying to get the film financed. Up to this point, only one full-length theatrical film had been made by a black woman, and not only was Harris indeed a black woman, but she was also a first-time filmmaker. So when she went to shop Just Another Girl on the IRT around, she was either told flat out, that's a no for me, dog," or she was told to alter large portions of her story, one studio even going as far as to tell her to make one character a drug dealer, because you know, that's what's in right now. Thankfully, that's not the story that Leslie Harris wanted to tell, and I applaud her for sticking to her guns and getting the film financed her way with help from others like author Terry McMillan. Just Another Girl on the IRT is kind of a misnomer because the main character Chantel, played by Arianne Johnson, is purposefully written not to be Just Another Girl on the IRT. The character is almost everything that a woman in hood films of the time are not, and that's the point to completely change your perception of what you expect from women in films like this. With a budget of only $130,000, did director Leslie Harris manage to put together a great film that goes against everything that black audiences wanted to see at the time? Let's black track and find out. Hey, where's this guy going? And why does he look so nervous? Oh, I see. This is the end of the movie, so we aren't meant to know yet. I'm a little intrigued though, so I won't criticize it. I want to know what's in the bag. When Leslie Harris was trying to sell this movie to different studios, some of them told her that this story would work better as a documentary, and even though she told them to kick rocks, Just Another Girl does kind of have a documentary vibe to it. If I had to compare it to any other film I've talked about, I would say the style is most like Fear of a Black Hat. But where that movie was decidedly a documentary, Just Another Girl just uses a film style that attempts to put you in the scenes as a bystander, a fly on the wall if you will. So when Chantel does stuff like break the fourth wall, she's not talking to you as if you're a reporter or interviewer, she's talking to you, the audience, as if you were just another person on the street. I'm a Brooklyn girl. Lots of folks think Brooklyn girls are real tough. <laughs> I guess that's true. I let nobody mess with me and I do what I want when I want. I think it's a cool technique because between that and the tight camera shots, you really do feel like you're a part of the environment and the atmosphere. The shaky handheld camera helps with that too. Speaking of the environment, I love that this movie takes place in the gritty, grimy era of New York with all the graffiti and stuff. Because growing up in the South, I knew absolutely nothing about 80s, 90s New York. But when I think New York, this is the version that I picture, not the new, clean, sterilized, gentrified version that we have now. Arianne Johnson got the role of Chantel after besting 200 other girls for the role. And I don't know what the other girls were like, but Arianne nails it. She's confident, smart, and kind of funny in a LaShawn from a living color kind of way. Excuse me, but for your information, my name is not Hey. If you can read the name text says LaShawn. I know when you first hear her talk, you might be tempted to write her off as quote unquote ghetto, but you'll be mistaken. She's far from it. I think the best term to describe her is sassy. Yeah, sassy is the right word. This was on purpose on the part of Leslie Harris because as she puts it, she didn't want to present a character that was all the way good or all the way bad. She wanted Chantel to be a character that was realistic and true to life and not shackled by any kind of typical character tropes. I like her overall style too. It's very colorful and Afrocentric. They described her as the Black Blossom and I've never heard a more accurate description. No matter how good you try to make everything look though, the budget cracks start to show. Like when Chantel and her best friend Natette meet up with their other friend Denisha. 
she just had a baby, allegedly. At least that's what they want us to believe while they talk to this blanket covering this non-existent baby. But you know what? I'd take this over an obvious baby doll and Denisha explaining in graphic detail what it was like to have a baby successfully distracts you from the empty stroller. What awful! Uh, I was like, uh, uh, enema? Enema. Enema. That's what the doctor should have been doing. Ugh. I could see some of this stuff grossing some people out, but I like the realness of it because these are conversations that real teenage girls have and that's the whole point of the movie. We get more great camera work when Chantel goes home and she has to take the stairs because the elevator is broken, something that's apparently common in New York government housing. These shots make you feel like you're another tenant coming down the stairs while she's coming up. I can hear them now. What's wrong with you girl? This is just the third floor. Why are you so tired? What is it, the braids? Okay, so the housing project is probably the one thing that connects this movie to its contemporary. However, Chantel lives in a two-parent home, something that's definitely uncommon and something that Leslie Harris thought would make for a compelling dynamic. Only problem is, the parents don't get much time or much to work with to make it really stand out. The dad works nights and the mother works days, so when things happen in the daytime, the mother is gone and the dad is sleeping, and when he's awake, he's angry and violent as f how can I complain though? At least he gets some lines. How many movies have I done where the dad doesn't even get to speak? If he even exists at all? Uh, so forget what I said about Chantel talking to bystanders when she breaks the fourth wall. Because who the hell would she be talking to in her bedroom in the middle of the night? Unless... Nah, she does that kind of action in the laundry room, which is some romantically ghetto fabulous ass shit if I've ever seen it. Which also opens up so many questions, like does nobody else in the building wash their clothes while y'all making out in the middle of the floor? And is everybody really sharing six machines in this massive ass building? This guy's Gerard, and I don't want to call him a simp, but he's kind of a simp. He's not really her boyfriend, and he don't get no buns because he ain't got no funds. Plus, Chantel talks to him all kinds of ways. He's the textbook definition if you ask me. Make sure y'all wash them sheets before y'all leave. You know what? Never mind. Y'all ain't do nothing anyway. So remember in Boys in the Hood when young Trey was woke as hell and school in the class? Well, Chantel is that times 10 because where young Trey only fought a student, I fully believe Chantel would beat the chalk out of her history teacher if she thought there would be no consequences. She hitting them with the facts though, F-A-X. But she just needs to work on her timing because you can't drop these kind of gems in the middle of a Holocaust discussion. I mean, African-American males die every day from drugs, violence, and AIDS. African-American babies die twice as much as white babies. Right here in this country, what's our obligation to that? For the crime of having the audacity to be the smartest person in the class, she's sentenced to a trip to Kevin Durant's daddy office. He's the principal, I think. Thank God he's not the guidance counselor, because all he does is discourage and belittle Chantel for her supposed attitude. All Chantel said was that she wants to go to college early so that she can get the hell out of the hood. And she's met with rebuttals like, not with that mouth, damn, why don't you tell her to stay in the kitchen too while you're at it? Chantel has ambition, and I like that. It's these kind of attitudes towards women seeking higher education that prompted Leslie Harris to even have to write a character like Chantel, who has to cuss everybody out just to be taken seriously. Maybe don't try to use those same tactics on your dad, though. Look, I don't like you hanging out with him. What's wrong with him? I don't like you dating anyone living in the projects. We live in the projects, Daddy. Who the fuck else am I supposed to date? I'm going to keep my opinions to myself about that slap because a lot of us can probably say that a lot worse has been done to us while simultaneously acknowledging that some of it was unnecessary trauma. I just hate that this scene more or less defines Chantel's father because he seemed like a decent dude before this and doesn't really get a redemption or a chance to show some contrast. The mother, on the other hand, gets to play the hero when she allows Chantel to go to a party that she really wanted to go to. A party that in hindsight has a lot of consequences. So who's the real bad parent here? Before that though, we get one of the realest scenes I've ever seen put to screen when Chantel and her friends show off how naive they are when it comes to sex. No matter what scene you can think of where they talk about sex, I'm sure it has nothing on this scene and the conversation in Just Another Girl has much more graphic detail. Even though about 95% of it is complete nonsense, 
I like how it highlights the dumb rumors you believe when you're a teen. I once had a friend tell me years ago that as long as sperm got into a woman's body through any opening, she could get pregnant. It didn't matter how it got in there, through the nose, the ear, the mouth, as long as it got in there, she was screwed. And that's why sex education is so important. That's just the reality of sex education in a society where people try to hide the truth from you until it's too late. Man, this scene really made me nostalgic. I really do miss the days when men and women used to take the time to come up with new and intricate routines that it would take to parties. I felt like all the girls when I was growing up was like mini choreographers. Luckily, Arianne Johnson was already a dancer and was able to put together this little routine for the movie. Poor Gerard. He's in way over his head and he doesn't even know it. I don't even understand why he would bring Chantel to this party in the first place. It really befuddles me. This isn't exactly a romantic date setting. At this point, I'm trying to figure out if Gerard and Chantel are even a couple because Chantel is grinding it up with damn near every dude at the party. She's the main event, but the only guy who even gets her to somewhat crack is this guy Ty. And what's so special about Ty? Well, he has a car, which apparently is a rare commodity in this New York neighborhood. I guess considering these are supposed to be teenagers, it would be kind of uncommon for a guy to be driving a brand new Jeep. Ty is the guy who that one studio wanted to be a drug dealer, and to play devil's advocate, he is looking a little Nino Brownish in this Jeep. Now Ted and Gerard can't believe it. Oh shit! Yo, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What does he have that I don't? He got a Jeep! So? I got tokens. <laughs> we get on the train anytime. Tokens? So when he said he took Chantel to the party, he meant on the train? Paying someone's fare isn't the same as taking them somewhere, right? Tell me if I'm crazy. The guy playing Gerard is supposed to be a real life comedian, so I'm not sure if the Tokens line was meant to be funny or to make him look like a sucker. Works both ways if you ask me. Maybe it's just me, but Ty is kinda corny. He's a bit of a mama's boy, and is always talking about his mama this and his mommy that. She bought him the car and everything else, and because of it, he has a very high opinion of himself. So it makes it even more upsetting that just another girl goes through a massive shift in Chantel's characterization and takes what was originally a strong, smart, hardworking, and ambitious teen and transforms her into a naive, indecisive, weak, silly ass girl out of nowhere and all because of this guy i kinda hate it i'm not gonna lie sure chantel was a little rough around the edges but i was slowly beginning to like the charm of the character and for whatever reason the movie decides to reverse all of that and have her fall for all the oldest tricks in the book to allow ty to have unprotected sex with her there's a bit of a time lapse too so not only do we not get the decency of a musical montage, but we also don't get the benefit of seeing their relationship grow. To at least give us somewhat of a reason to believe she would throw all of her convictions away for this guy, at least for any other reason than he has a Jeep. Uh oh, Chantel throwing up lemonade. You know what that means? Well, we the audience knows what that means, but Chantel has to do more research about sex first. Because you know, what better time to start studying plumbing after you've already let somebody flood the basement? Chantel and the tech confirmed what we already knew by taking three pregnancy tests. And for even more confirmation, she goes to the doctor to verify. And yep, she's indeed booted up. Even though this is 1992, just another girl on the IRT gets pretty timely when Chantel goes to see a counselor about options. She tries to give her all the usual avenues, from adoption to just raising the baby with the father. But Chantel wants to know more about this abortion thing she heard so much about. Problem is, the place this lady works for is government funded. And even back then, actually more so back then, the government was really sensitive about the A word. I want to find out an abortion. It's my decision, not the fucking government. Damn, sounds familiar. Hey, I wonder how Ty's going to react when she tells him that she's knocked up. You what? How could you? Yo, that's impossible. You were taking the pill, right? Hold up. How I know it's mine? This ain't my problem. Oh, really? Yo, check this shit out. <laughs> if you pulling this shit so I can marry you, bitch, forget it. That's what it ah, the classics. They never get old. One thing I've always loved about guerrilla filmmaking is the drive to get the shot no matter what. Similar to what Robert Townsend did with Hollywood Shuffle, Leslie Harris shot this movie with no permits or permission to film in any of the locations, instead relying on a get in and get out method to get all the shots. On this particular night, a commercial was being filmed right next to this bridge that they needed for this shot. And instead of ratting out Harrison crew, the producer of the commercial saw that the Just Another Girl crew had poor lighting 
and decided to share some of their big budget lights with them to make the scene look better. That's why it looks like it was lit from only one side. I love that story because the establishment could have easily hated on the up and comer, but instead they decided to throw a little shine their way. Man, why are you sneaking around looking all suspicious? Aren't you a student too? On to plan B. No, not the one we're all familiar with. It's a little too late and too early for that, so to speak. Nah, the plan B you actually had to put some effort into back then. Ty borrowed some money from his uncle to pay for an abortion. $500 to be exact. And god damn that's expensive. Not that I would know personally or anything, but I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that says it's nowhere near that expensive. At least not where I'm from. I do find it kind of funny that even up there, they have to go out of state to get it done. Like even back then, it was cheaper to go somewhere else. I hate to judge Chantel and her situation, but I'm with Ty. She kind of getting on my damn nerves. She doesn't want to go through with the abortion, but she's also not doing anything to prepare for the baby. No prenatal care, no nothing. She's putting more effort into buying proper underwear and hiding it from her parents than her and her baby's health. And I know all of this is supposed to play into the fact that she's a young, dumb, and naive teenager. But that's the problem. She's not a young, dumb, and naive teenager. Like I said earlier, making her dumb and indecisive all of a sudden just ruins everything about Chantel. And that's not even the worst part. You ever watch a movie and the main character does something so out of character that it makes it hard for you to take them serious anymore? I know this is random, but thank Christian from Higher Learning. Out of nowhere, they decide to turn her into a lesbian, even though there's no indication that she was prior. Her earlier assault somehow translates to a storyline where she's getting groomed by another woman. It completely kills your investment, because up until that point, it feels like something the character wouldn't do. Okay, so back to just another girl on the IRT. Ty gives her the $500, and even though Chantel decides she doesn't want to get the abortion, the Chantel I know would have either given the money back, used the money for something future college related, or at least got something for the upcoming baby. But instead, Chantel takes this money and goes shopping? What the f <sighs> What? This is the most irredeemable thing that Chantel does. And trust me, I'm not taking any heat off Ty either, because that idiot should have gone with her to make sure she used the money the right way. But just like the audience, he had faith in her that she would do the right thing, as misplaced as that was. Another thing that kind of sucks is the sense of time in this movie. Because they had no budget to simulate a real pregnancy, we have no idea how many months she truly is. So when she starts having contractions one night at Ty's place, the first thing I was thinking was, oh sh this is a miscarriage, only to be reminded that she's about eight months, so the baby is actually coming early. The movie kind of gets away with this by having Chantel break the fourth wall to explain to us how she's hiding her stomach and appetite from her parents, so at least somebody took it into consideration. What follows is one of the most graphic depictions of a childbirth I think I've ever seen, and that's a compliment, because with how low the budget is, I'm actually impressed with how they managed to make it so gritty and realistic. This is one of those situations where the low budget actually makes it better, because like I said earlier, the way the film is shot puts you right in the room with them and makes you just as uncomfortable. With nobody else to turn to, Chantel has Ty call that counselor from earlier. You know, the one who didn't want to tell Chantel about the smushmortion? She tries to walk Ty through it, but he's a bit of a dumbass. Actually, I take that back. I take a lot of the stuff I said about Ty back, because when the baby actually comes out, Santel quickly becomes the villain in this situation. You cannot abandon a baby like that. Somebody might see me go out with the baby. Damn it! Just take it out now! My goodness, I feel bad for Ty. And now we know the answer to my question from earlier in the movie. What's in the bag? Well, this show ain't Brenda. Ty's got a baby. Whole time I'm watching this, I just kept thinking to myself, there is no way this movie ends on this downer of an ending after putting us through all that. But I think halfway through, I think Ty had a moment of clarity and thought to himself, this girl hasn't made a smart decision since the day I met her. What the f am I doing? He brings the baby back just in time for the counselor to get there and we get a postscript telling us how everything turned out. Chantel is still at her parents' house with the new baby. Her and Ty broke up. She's going to community college and she's dating a new man. So hold up. After all that, she is 
just another girl on the IRT, huh? Damn. Let's get to the grade. Like I said, who knows if I'm even qualified to critique just another girl on the IRT because I'm definitely not the target audience. However, just because I can't relate to it on a personal level doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy it. I love the cinematography and the grittiness of it. The movie feels and looks like something that could have happened in real life. It really does give the vibe that somebody just followed Chantel and crew around and documented everything that happened. For that and what it managed to do with a tight budget, I applaud it. However, I'm definitely not a fan of the change in characterization of Chantel halfway through. She was so compelling in the beginning, and I feel that by giving her a by the numbers pregnancy story, it did irreparable damage to the plot. The minute that happens, she ironically turns into just another statistic in these type of movies. And of course, I understand that wasn't the expectation, and in 1992, it probably was very relatable. But in 2024, we expect more from women in films. And looking back, it inadvertently makes her a weaker character. Also kind of ironic is that in an effort to make a film with strong black women, Just Another Girl ends up also making a film with terrible black men. Something I'm sure wasn't intentional, but I just found it to be kind of funny that it ended up doing the same thing it accused other movies of doing, just in reverse. Overall, as a movie I had no prior knowledge of, I actually enjoyed Just Another Girl on the IRT. And it's a shame that it's Leslie Harris's one and only movie to date because it feels like this movie is overdue for a modern remake. My grade for Just Another Girl on the IRT is a C-. Arianne Johnson shines, but she's let down by an inconsistent script. And that's it for this episode of The Black Track. Let me know your feelings on Just Another Girl on the IRT in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'll holla at you.